Hi, so I'm Allison McDowell. I'm here today at um, outside of Columbia, Maryland. This is the Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Lab. Um, uh, I'm here on behalf of the brothers and sisters of life and mothers all over the world to um, sort of expose some facets of the COVID response that I think need to be discussed more openly. And um, a, a lot of people are familiar with Event 201, which was an event, um, a tabletop exercise that was held last fall in conjunction with Johns Hopkins uh, School of Public Health uh, with money from Bill Gates. Um, and also Michael Bloomberg, indirectly Bloomberg Philanthropies, as well as um, some folks who had been affiliated with Facebook. Um, and so as part of this tabletop exercise, there were a number of key players involved, and one of them was Avril Haynes, who had a long career um, working with sort of state interests, um, including a, a time spent with the Applied Physics Lab. And so I hadn't heard of this before, and I was interested in learning more about what was going on with this Applied Physics Lab, which, although it's with Johns Hopkins, um, does most of its contracting with um, U.S. intelligence and defense interests. And um, so essentially this, this uh, public-private partnership was created out of World War II, and um, this, this entity has done a lot around um, missile guidance systems and radar and satellites. Um, and, and that may seem like, what does that have to do with COVID at all? Um, but uh, one of the, the things I want to address is that um, there are actually several recent contracts with DARPA um, that involve things that I think we should be talking about. And one of them is um, uh, the, a, a contract with DARPA that was issued in May of 2018 in which the Applied Physics Lab was going to work on a project called um, Ground Truth or Hidden Truth. And the, fo the focus was looking at social contagion and social media and an predictive analytics around um, social systems modeling. Um, and I think we understand what's going on now with uh, uh, monitoring of information and painting things as fake news and the ways in which um, our written communications and visual communications online um, feed into a bigger understanding of social relationships and then how that is used to advance certain interests over others. Um, so my, my question would be is, um, what are those intelligence interests um, in mapping this hidden ground truth uh, through the Applied Physics Lab and to whose benefit, right, to whose benefit. Um, so I also want to note that there is another um, project that they were involved with, specifically um, with Facebook. So uh, this is a, an article from the previous year, 2017, in which uh, they tout a technology that would allow Facebook users to type words using only their thoughts. So that is part of this, is that um, this Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Lab is working directly with Facebook on sort of human computer systems engineering with mind systems, like mind brain systems with computing. Um, and I'm sure they would love to sell that as a lovely thing, but I guess the, the, there are larger questions about whose interests are being served, especially when there, some um, in, individuals whose money comes from Facebook were also at Event 201 uh, with Avril Haynes. So, um, you know, today we're going, we're part of a, we're doing some field work in Baltimore, in the Baltimore area, to talk about this. But I feel like really what is happening across the world um, is a, a militaristic pr project that is looking to incorporate human life into what's called the Internet of Bodies, which is being advanced by the World Economic Forum and Klaus Schwab, his great reset is this idea that we will become integrated in with computing systems. And this feeds into this idea of social contagion online and human thought processes, both of which are happening here in the, in the greater Baltimore area. We're about 20, 25 minutes outside of Baltimore. Um, and I'm here to contest that narrative. I'm here to say that we do not consent to having this done to us. And we do not consent to be kept in the dark. And we do not consent to um, injections via nanotechnology that might seek to put us into this internet of bodies to manipulate our lives and the lives of the natural world into these larger techno technocratic systems that are really fundamentally militaristic and anti-life. So, um, you know, I've done this before. It's hard, you know, I would say the next spot we're going to go is Catonsville and people ask, you know, what can individual people do, right? And, and how do we break the spell that we're in, the spell of militarism and fear? 
And sometimes it just takes individual people stepping up to say what the truth is. The truth is they understand it. And the truth as I understand it is that um, partnerships with Johns Hopkins and the military are seeking to advantage interests of um, the billionaire class over the masses in ways that will ultimately harm us and foreclose a human future to push us into this cyborg or centaurist type of future. So I'm here to sort of say no to that, to say that we revoke any consent implied or outright to that program, um, that we have taken it back, we have taken on our own power to stand in our own power. And I, I brought some, uh, some sage with me today. <laughs> Um, so in my small act of defiance, this is sage that is from sacred Lakota land that I was invited to take as medicine against these larger forces. And so sage is for cleansing. And I'm here doing my small part to try to do a cleansing against this militaristic project, this project that even advanced tomahawk missiles, very racist, terrible name to give this, this technology of destruction. And we're not having it anymore. So I'm symbolically, um, I'm gonna do my sage. Yep, we've got some smoke here. And uh, this is a, a marker marking this 50 year the ostensible military progress um, for this country. And I'm here to sort of cleanse this it says, with pride in our achievements during the first 50 years and a belief that it will make significant contributions in the next 50, in 1992, they pre pre present these mementos of the day in this time capsule. So I don't know what twisted things are in this time capsule of this military psychological manipulation project, but um, we're here for life. We're here for human life. We're here for right relationships between humanity and the larger natural forces and natural energetic forces of the world, not these contrived satellite systems. And we're, we're, we're here to refuse the future that they would like to advance through Johns Hopkins, through these esteemed Ivy League institutions that are not working for the benefit of the people. And to, that we know that this is a threat, not just for citizens of the United States, but for, for all of the peoples of the world, because these technologies are coming all around the world and it's, it's going to be domination by satellite and radar and these devices that we are connected to and that will soon be integrated into our bodies if we don't say no. So I'm here to say no. Our next stop is we're going to go to Catonsville where individuals took it upon themselves with Daniel and Philip Berrigan um, to destroy um, draft records, military records um, during the Vietnam War to take a stand against what they knew was wrong, even though it was hard. And even as individuals, maybe things feel bigger than you would, would expect. But we're here to say as individuals that, that we're breaking the spell that we're under, that this COVID spell is about militarism and, and it, we're saying it stops now. Hello. How's it going? Yeah, we're just um, talking about a couple we're of We're just talking about some of the, the physics we're doing a, a, a thing about some of the work they're doing here. Okay, uh, you just can't be on property doing that. You can't record on property. Oh, but is, isn't, is it public? I mean, is, mostly it's doing public work, right? No, no, this is private property. This is, private, this is owned by John Hopkins. This is private property. You gotta be oh. off campus to do Oh, that. okay, well, we were just in the visitor parking area. Okay. It's, I mean, it doesn't seem too crowded. Yeah, right? but it, it's, you can't record while you're on, while you're on property. I mean, is there a reason or just, it's, it's I just, mean, we're not harming anything. It's policy, that's, that's all it is. It's the overall policy. Yes. Okay. All right. Well, what well, we will we will be leaving here. Do you? Where was my last little thing? Okay. Well, I think we we did our thing. Essentially, we're just you know the stuff with ground truth. Oh, we're just visitors. We're heading right. out then. Can All right. Your name? Okay, so we, we just got sort of chased out of the uh, Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Lab by the security guards. They said it was private property and we are not allowed to be there. So, uh, you know, we are not looking for confrontation. So we, we packed up and we came down the road just a bit of ways, but they manage pretty much all of the land around here. So uh, this, we're sort of in the parking lot of this little um, like subdivision posh 
subdivision townhomes for probably all the intelligence community that lives out here. Uh, but we're off on the edge of the woods because this is where about natural nature, right? And I'm under this amazing tree that is an oak tree that has been here way before uh, the 1942 creation of the Johns Hopkins Applies Physics Lab. And we're here to sort of reconnect with with these natural forces, that's what it's about. It's about stepping away from this contrived manufactured energy system that radar and satellite and internet of bodies back onto our natural force. And so before we head off to our next spot, I just wanted to take a minute because we didn't get to do it there. We did a sage cleansing. Um, but one of my friends who is an energy healer um, had an intention that was about restoring balance. And I think right now we, it's very clear that the world is incredibly out of balance. The power, people who are hoarding power and hoarding wealth over the masses. And um, so sort of with this oak leaf and with my, my crystal, I just wanna take a minute um, to say this intention about restoring balance because I think it's important that that's really what we're about is restoring proper balance and right relationships. Um, so I'm just gonna read this. I don't have it memorized. Uh, this, is, this is from a friend who is in energy healing and something that she uses but I think it could be of use to all of us. And there's a much longer version that is much more complicated about energy systems, but um, I'm going to read the shorter version here. So, I am attuning optimally and infinitely to any and all frequencies, wavelengths, vibrations, sentience, and information associated with the consciousness and beingness associated with the Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Laboratory and all of those who are employed by that system or are working under contracts for that system. And in alignment with MetaSync and my inner guidance, may it be so in body and mind and spirit with infinite gratitude and grace, TLC, abundance, compassion, forgiveness, love, light, and joy. And so it is in harmony with the cosmic natural order and in concert with the cosmic symphony. And so we are here today understanding that all of the people who are rolling out this apparatus of techno-fascism are all children of the earth, whether they have lost their path or they are dreaming in this ideal that somehow big data and analytics and AI will make the world a better place. Um, and so we are hoping that the balance, by being here today, we will start to tip it back in the favor of life and love and abundance. And so I also want to leave here under this oak a small tobacco offering. And, and we, we, thank, we thank the creator for our ability to still have mobility and to be able to come to these spaces and tell these stories and speak these truths. And we thank them for the tobacco of carrying these wishes um, to the greater world and I would say today that we are here in gratitude that even in the midst of all of that destruction that the natural world still exists and is accessible to us and that we can touch it and connect with that power that is still there for us. So we, we have gratitude for that and we, we, we are here to pray to put our intentions out into the world that that balance be restored and that it be, we work towards a world that is bathed in natural natural energy systems um, that bring wholeness to all of us. So I'm just going to bring this to the tree here. All right, uh, Allison McDowell, I'm out here. We're in Catonsville, Maryland. We're about 20 minutes drive from the Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Lab where we were earlier today. And these two sites are, are connected. Um, we're here today to pay tribute to um, a group of radical uh, Catholics who in 1968, uh, the year I was born, um, entered into a draft board building about a block from this location here at, in Catonsville and burned many of the, the draft record files that would prevent people, it was the day before the clouds, right? So that would prevent um, young men from being drafted to go to Vietnam. And they did that as a protest of the atrocities, the US military atrocities that were taking place, not only in Vietnam, but beyond um, two prominent um, Catholics uh, brothers, Daniel and Philip Berrigan, um, also several lay people um, who, were, who were doing work in both Guatemala and Uganda and seeing 
um, the, the terrible things that were happening in the name of our country in those places as well. And so they took it upon themselves to take a stand um, and destroy those records as, as, as public property to um, catalyze and trigger a, a much larger campaign of civil disobedience um, nationwide. And they did federal time for that, those, that act of civil disobedience. And I just, I wanna be here today in contact of looking at what was happening at the Applied Physics Lab with the, the creation of those weapons guidance systems. Um, these, many of these folks later, it became the plowshares movement, opposing nuclear weapons and these militaristic um, weapons, this apparatus of domination around the world. And they put themselves on the line, not because they were part of hundreds or thousands of people in the street. This was a small group of nine people who on their conscience said that they could not stand by and allow this to happen. And so they, they, they sacrificed a great deal of themselves to do this and they did it willingly with open and loving hearts. And so I just, on our way to Baltimore, I wanted to stop and sort of, if, if we're looking for balance, if the applied physics lab is the dark energy, then this is the light. And this is the piece that we need to push more back into the balance of the equation. Um, so I have here, again, a small tobacco offering in, in a shell here that I, I will leave here at this historic marker. And also a piece of mica that I, I have found recently and, and the symbol, symbolism of mica is to be able to self-reflect and it's fragile but we need to be able to look at ourselves and to be able to to become better people and to still look at the world with love and humility and even despite all of our frailties and the wrong in the world that if we look in deeply in us we are all um, reflections of the creator and the cosmic dance of life and we are good we have that goodness and so we need to, to look into ourselves and I think the actions that were taken by the Catonsville Nine um, and Daniel and Philip Berrigan against the war all those times is very important because what we're living through right now, it is a war. What's coming with 5G and the Internet of Bodies, it is a war on humanity wrought by militaristic interests and we're not seeing it as a war but it isn't a public health situation, it is actually the plan is that it will be a war on our minds and bodies and a, and a war of domination using these satellite technologies that were refined in many respects during the Vietnam War. So I'm going to place this here in tribute to their work. And I would also like to read um, their statement that they read upon the burning of these draft records. And what they did was they actually created, they used the recipe and they created napalm. And that is what they've used to burn burn those records and it's important because a lot of these technologies that were developed as part of the Vietnam War and the defoliant and Agent Orange have come back around and roundups and these toxic chemicals that are now being used against us and killing our internal microbiomes and it, it's, it's weapons of mass destruction of all humanity so this history is actually really really relevant to today so this is the statement and this was from May 17 1968 Nine people, including Father Daniel Berrigan and his brother, Father Philip Berrigan, entered a draft board and removed draft files for those who were about to be sent to Vietnam. And they took these files outside and burned them with homemade napalm, a weapon commonly used on civilians by U.S. forces. And then they awaited their arrest by authorities. The following is the statement made by Dan Berrigan, read in court during their trial. Some 10 or 12 of us, the number is still uncertain, will, if all goes well or ill, take our religious bodies during this week to a draft center in or near Baltimore. And there we shall, of purpose and forethought, remove the 1A files and sprinkle them in the public street with homemade napalm and set them afire, for which act we shall beyond a doubt uh, be placed behind bars for some portion of our natural lives in consequence of our inability to live and die content in the plagued city. To say peace, peace, when there is no peace. To keep the poor, poor, the home, less. The thirsty and hungry, homeless, thirsty and hungry. Our apologies, dear friends, for the fracture of good order, the burning of paper instead of children, the anger of the orderlies in, front, in the front parlor of the charnel house. We could not, so help us God, do otherwise. For we are sick at heart, 
Our hearts give us no rest for thinking of the land of burning children and for thinking that other child of whom the poet Luke speaks, the infant, was taken up in the arms of an old man whose tongue grew resonant and vatic at the touch of that beauty. And the old man spoke, this child is set for the fall and rise of many in Israel, a sign that is spoken against. Small consolation, a child born to make trouble and to die for it. The first Jew, not the last, to be subject of a definitive solution. He sets up the cross and dies on it in the Rose Garden of the executive mansion on the DC Mall in the court of the Pentagon. We see the sign, we read the direction, you must bear with us for his sake, or if you will not, the consequences are on your own. For it will be easy, after all, to discredit us. Our record is bad, troublemakers in church and state, a priest married despite his vows, two convicted felons. We have jail records. We have been turbulent, uncharitable. We have failed in love for the brethren, have yielded to fear and despair and pride often in our lives. Forgive us. We are no more when truth is told than ignorant beset men jockeying against all chance at the hour of death for a place at the right hand of the dying one. We act against the law at a time of the poor people's march, at a time moreover when the government is announcing ever more massive paramilitary means to confront disorder in the cities. It is announced at a computerized center a computerized center is being built in the Pentagon at a cost of some $7 million to offer instant response to outbreaks anywhere in the land. That is the physics lab. That moreover, the government takes so serious a view of civil disorder that federal troops with war experience in Vietnam will have first responsibility to quell civil disorder. The implications of all of this must strike horror in the mind of any thinking man. The war in Vietnam is more and more literally brought home to us. Its innermost meaning strikes the American ghettos in servitude to the affluent. We must resist and protest this crime. Finally, we stretch out our hands to our brothers throughout the world. We who are priests to our fellow priests and all of us who act against the law to turn to the poor of the world, to the Vietnamese, to the victims, to the soldiers who kill and die for the wrong reasons, for no reason at all because they were so ordered by the authorities of that public order, which is in effect a massive institutionalized disorder. We say killing is disorder. Life and gentleness and community and unselfishness is the only order we recognize. For the sake of that order, we risk our liberty, our, go our good name. The time is past when good men can remain silent, when obedience can segregate men from public risk, when the poor can die without defense. We ask our fellow Christians to consider in their hearts a question which has tortured us night and day since the war began. How many must die before our voices are heard? How many must be tortured, dislocated, starved, maddened? How long must the world's resources be raped in the service of legalized murder? When at what point will we say no to this war? We have chosen to say with the gift of our liberty, if necessary, our lives. The violence stops here. The death stops here. The suppression of the truth stops here. This war stops here. We wish also to place in question by this act all suppositions about normal times, about longings for an untroubled life in a somnolent church, about a neat timetable of ecclesiastical renewal in which respect to the needs of men amounts to another form of time serving. Redeem the times. The times are inexpressibly evil. Christians pay conscious, indeed, religious tribute to Caesar and Mars by the approval of overkill tactics, by brinksmanship, by nuclear liturgies, by racism, by support of genocide. They embrace their society with all of their heart and abandon the cross, and they pay lip service to Christ and military service to the power of death. And yet, and yet, the times are inexhaustibly good solaced by the courage and hope of many, the truth rules, Christ is not forsaken. In a time of death, some men, the resistors, those who work heartily for social change, those who preach and embrace the unpalatable truth, such men overcome death. Their lives are bathed in the light of the resurrection. The truth has set them free. In the jaws of death, of contumely, of good and ill report, they proclaim their love of the brethren. We think of such men in the world in our nation, in the churches, and in the stone in our breast, in the stone in our breast is dissolved, and we take heart once more. Individual people can take strong actions and catalyze the change that is needed. 
and we need to know this history and we need to reflect on that history and our time in this historic moment and where we stand and will we stand for the truth and will we stand for the children. Our post-lunch uh, excursion, and now we are in Baltimore. So we've made it into Baltimore, and um, one of the things we were talking about when we were walking to, to lunch was when you go to places, you can actually see the landscape. You can see how the terrain works, and you can see some of the history. And so, you know, one of the things I noticed as we were parking the car were these um, 19th century buildings and bank buildings and insurance buildings. And we're in the Inner Harbor and understanding Baltimore as, as a, a maritime trading center and a center that was um, used, it, a very prominent location for the domestic slave trade um, when they were moving um, enslaved families from the, the Chesapeake area to the sugar plantations in the mid 19th century. Much of that was done out of Baltimore. And so I'm just, I'm drawing these connections because we need to understand we're operating within a historic continuum and these threats of like family separation and treating people as property and using, you know, non-consensual labor and all of these factors are nothing that we have escaped. We are simply like living through it again in different iterations. So as we look at the sort of uh, bio-capitalist, human capital impact investing program that's happening today in Baltimore, um, like being on this land and seeing how this works, um, it, it just reminds me um, there, there's a tall masted ship behind us. And so I'm here right now, this is our first stop. Um, I'm not sure how much of my battery will hold up, so we'll, we'll see. Um, but this is the, the headquarters of Yet Analytics. And Yet Analytics is somewhere on the fourth floor of this mall. Um, it doesn't show on the, the, um, the directory, which is interesting, even though it does say for sure on their website. On their, on their website. Oh, they can't hear? Yeah. Oh, okay. It, they haven't heard any of it? No, they said you're very faint. Oh, okay. So anyway, so they're... They're, um, <laughs> they're up on the fourth floor. They're up on Yet Analytics. So Yet Analytics is important because they've actually, the woman who uh, co-founded that, her name is uh, Shelly Blake Pock, and she came out of Johns Hopkins. They do work with the military and they do work around online education and tracking education systems and how people interact with online education. And so what's going to happen is when these human capital markets come online with blockchain, which is again based in admiralty law, right? So we're in a harbor city with maritime trade, so there are these connections. Um, when the blockchain education comes, they're going to be measuring what they put into you as um, human capital in terms of your lifelong learning and the badges that you will earn interacting with online modules. Much of this was developed um, through military training of soldiers with XAPI technology and virtual reality technology. They are partnered with Hewlett Packard and Hewlett Packard is looking at these AI engines of human capital analytics. And Hewlett Packard was a company that really excelled in risk scoring and flight scoring its own employees. So they could tweak how much they would pay you depending on how much they thought you needed the job or how likely you would be to leave your job. And that was one of the things that they are known for. So they're applying this thought process of like, how can we figure you out to the point that we can pay you the least amount and value you the least amount and manage you to enhance our bottom line against their own employees. Imagine what they would do to people who are enrolled in the military or small children who are um, kindergartners forced in front of online learning programs. So I just, I, I think it's important to be here and talking about Yet Analytics in Baltimore because it's connected to the impact investing which, will, which is playing out through the Annie Casey Foundation and probably Catholic Relief Services. Um, that program with Hewlett Packard is called the Education Data Command Center and the, the system that they launched in London, again, the center of blockchain, is the EIDCC Artificial Intelligence Platform for Human Capital Investment. So this is all about work-based learning and keeping people hooked into online systems and virtual reality systems to reskill them for jobs they may, may never even be able to get because the robots will have the jobs, but they'll have to keep performing as if they were ever going to get a job. So anyway, that's it about yet, yet analytics. Maybe you could just sweep around and show the ship back there. Like we've got a ship back there and um, we're hoping to do a couple more visits today to uh, both Catholic Relief Services, Johns Hopkins School of Public Health and uh, the NE Casey Foundation.
All right, so we're down here at the Inner Harbor, and as I said, like we have this tall masthead ship behind us, sort of a representation of the legacy of the transatlantic slave trade, right? And they, it, that is what the human capital bond markets are built on. So we want to do um, just a bit of a ceremony here on the water because I feel like in these days of isolation, people feel disconnected, but we are actually connected together through natural systems, including water systems. And it's really important. I've connected with people who are, are feel very strongly about um, blessing the water and our ability to um, invoke kindness upon the waters and, and actually chemically change waters and, and tap into water as memory and try to sort of address some of that. And I think especially when we're thinking about the nature of domination in which water has been used to precipitate terrible things on, on peoples here on this continent, that that is an important thing to do here in Baltimore. So um, I have a few materials and that we each have a few sort of symbolic items. Um, the first one is a piece of sage. It is a sage brush from Lakota land that, that we brought. We are gonna put these on the waters. Um, sage is representing um, sort of a cleansing and a, and a leaving the old to, to awaken to the new, which I think a lot of us who are understanding what's happening in the world are looking for answers and looking to for new knowledges and ways, new ways of looking at the world and incorporating information. So, so this is the cleansing part. We have mica, which I had mentioned we had some of that at the, at the Catonsville Nine Monument, but that is about self-reflection and flexibility and growth and also being able to understand the fragileness of humanity and the flaws in humanity, but being able to proceed with love in our hearts towards a better resolution. So that's the mica. And then we have an oak leaf, which is from sort of my special place in the Wissahickon off of Kitchens Creek. And this oak leaf is a representation of, of honor and um, power and strength, particularly internal strength, because I think that is something that we're all feeling is that we need to tap into sort of our internal strength to get through what we're living through right now in, in, in our lockdown moment. So um, we also each have a tiny pinch of tobacco and I have in this chalice, um, this is water from the harbor. Um, the, the tide is a little bit low now, so we, I pulled it up and put it in this chalice. And I'm just going to say a few words of care on this water and we will um, add sort of some blessings in the tobacco on the water. Um, and then we will, we will place all of that and our good intentions into the water today. And we will, will hope to do that, to spread this message um, to, to others who are connected to other water systems so that they're able to reflect with a better understanding on what is happening and to, to begin to heal in meaningful, real ways. So I just wanna say, here's, here's the water. And um, I'm gonna just touch the water and, and say, um, the importance of the water to life and love and, and birth and rebirth and, and peace. May we bring peace to the waters and cleanliness and health and, um, and that we, may we be quenched in this water and that we, may we bring our intentions to have this water bring connection to all of us across the world because what, what is needed now is is global connection of all of the people um, across race and class to, to address past injustices and to, to foreclose the new injustices that are coming um, with these systems. So a blessing on the water and I just I thank the creator for this tobacco, this opportunity to be here today with other like-minded people and to think these big thoughts and to have our hearts open and to, to hope for a better future. So um, with thanks for this tobacco, I'm just gonna say a quick quick thank you in my heart and we'll pass the tobacco around and then we'll, we'll be placing our, our things in the inner harbor, so. All right, and uh, so, okay. So, blessings upon the water. May you carry our good intentions to humanity in this moment of challenge. May we have strength in our hearts and honor the good intentions. 
May we have clarity and flexibility and the ability to look at our own flaws and to leave behind those things that no longer serve us and be the humans that we are called to be in this moment. And that we may be cleansed through our understanding of the past injustice and do the heart work, which is challenging work, to make amends for those past injustices and to try to move together into a future that is better. May we be cleansed of that. All right. And that is the end of our, our bit of our ceremony. I will say that um, my, my colleague who is a water walker who taught me about ceremony and the water, um, she said that there was a, a, a Lakota a story about um, the creator um, being very fed up with humanity and wanting to sort of finish the world off. And the eagle came and said, wait, wait, let's not be too hasty. Give me a little bit of time. And, um, and so the eagle flew around the world and flew and didn't see anything for quite a number of days. And then it was sort of despairing. And then at the end, saw one man and one woman who are continuing the old ways and the old ceremonies. And, and that was restorative, that there were still a few people holding the old ways and then went back to the creator. And, and that was enough to, to stave off the end of the world. And you know, we're not doing this today in a, in a um, spirit of cultural appropriation. I was, I was told by this, this friend who is Lakota that really what we need to do is we need to, we need to come from a place of gratitude and restoring the right relationships and we need to pray over this because what's coming is very big. It's, it's bigger than any one of us individually. And so, um, so I'm here today sort of trying to fulfill my, my promise to carry these prayers out into the world. And, and I'm not usurping formal ceremony, but just to carry the, this idea of ceremony on the water and a blessing of the water um, because it, we feel like that's what connects us all. So thank you. Hi, so we're still here in Baltimore. I just wanted to stop for a second in front of this building. Um, this is the US Post Office and Courthouse. And um, you know, we earlier in the day, we're at the Catonsville 9 um, historic site where the draft records were burned. And this was the building where their case was tried, it was right here in this building, and that was significant. So I just wanted to make sure that we got this on camera today and just to make the sort of continuation of that story is that it ended up um, from Catonsville here in Baltimore at the, the courthouse building. So we're still here in Baltimore. Uh, we've moved over, what, what is this area? Does it have a neighborhood Mount name? Vernon. Like the Mount Vernon area. Uh, this is uh, the NEE Casey Foundation headquarters. And um, why this is important is the NEKC Foundation um, was the foundation that essentially started and jump-started um, the impact, global impact markets. And they started something called the Mission Investors Exchange um, in the early 2000s. And now this has about 124 different um, social finance um, firms that are involved in this, everything from education technology, uh, privatizing interest in education and healthcare, and other things that are tied to what might otherwise sound like nice social welfare services, but it is all about uh, data-driven, using people as data-driven commodities. Um, and they have close ties to Strive Together, which is um, the collective impact human capital project that's in over 70 communities all over the country. So it's important to know um, NEE Casey is very closely affiliated, affiliated with UPS, United Parcel Service. Um, the money for it came out of um, the gentleman who founded it, I believe it was Jim Casey, was he started UPS in Seattle. He was a bike courier. And then eventually um, he, his mother, he had a, his mo a single mother with several siblings. And in honor of that, he, he started doing a bunch of ch uh, charity work around foster care. So there's always been a real big focus on foster care in the Casey Foundation. And for a while, it moved from Seattle to Connecticut, and then it's come down to Baltimore in the mid-1990s, and it's been there ever since. Um, so it's really important to understand the way in which foster care is also a social impact market, um, but it's, it's part of this human capital analytics. And they, they, hold, they run something called the Kids Count Data Center. 
So they've been aggregating data on um, the situation of children living in poverty or difficult economic circumstances for a long time. And they've been building these databases. Um, and now it will be integrated because UPS, um, more than half of their board are people from UPS. And actually there was a UPS official at Event 201. So that's another overlap there with the COVID situation that the UPS Foundation head was at Event 201. Much of their board is tied to UPS. And, and the thing about UPS is they are very far ahead in supply chain management, global supply chains and tracking um, shipments and parcels. Only, you know, I've written a blog post on, on my blog, Wrench in the Gears, it, it says when we are the packages. What happens when we are stuck in our house and instead of us being allowed out in the world, we're stuck at home and our function in the world is consume packages from UPS and Amazon that's shipped to our door to manage our food and our clothing and other items that may be um, depend on you know, our behavior, our tokenized behaviors to access these basic necessity items. So it's really important to understand how United Parcel Service overlaps with the Casey Foundation and children and data because it's all about the data. This is not in any way about um, caring for children, the individual circumstances as children, these are children as a market for impact investing, which is what Mission Investors Exchange is about. Um, these capital aggregation funds. And, and again, these markets are around early childhood education, around early literacy education, and also increasingly around wraparound services. They have something called the two generation program where they're actually targeting the parents as impact investments in addition to the children. And if you, um, you know, early on I spoke about um, the ties into the, the, the slave trade, the domestic slave trade, and we understand how in many cases um, systems of power would use people's children as weapons against families and hold them against, hold the threat of family separation to compel people to do things they would not otherwise do. And, and that, that is part of this equation in the social welfare state as it becomes weaponized against people, as it becomes tied into global financial markets that same trajectory, that same racialized approach to social, social welfare will be coming up again and the NE Casey Foundation is an integral part of that. And I will, I will just point out, you know, one of the things I like to do when I come is to actually just see the, the physical layout. And I know we, we can't pivot the camera necessarily, but um, the, across the street is the First Unitarian Church of Baltimore. Um, so it's, when I say what is coming is, is, is techno-fascist control of people as data commodities on blockchain tied in with their health status, that that's going to be the ushering in of this techno-fascist program, many of the investors beyond the hedge funds are also going to be faith communities, right? And these are going to be communities who would like to pat themselves on the back that being good people and doing charity work. And they're going to be pouring money into pre-K and into these systems. Um, and they may not be interested in looking too closely about what's actually happening with these systems. And so in January, before any of the situation happened with COVID, um, I actually gave a talk at a Unitarian church in Philadelphia about race and technology. And it was, it was they were featuring Clyde Ford's book, Think Black. And he, his father was the first black programmer at IBM. And it was looking at all of the racialization of corporate America, being a black man in corporate America, but especially being at IBM, which had a history of using technology um, in, way, in, in Nazi Germany, the Hollerith cards, and also in South Africa in apartheid laws, that IBM was an instrumental part of that. And it continues to be part of the data aggregation and profiling now that we know in um, education settings and healthcare settings both. Um, so it's important to understand how that intersects with capital markets. And you know, sometimes I try to figure out who my audience is for these messages, right? And, and it's hard because I feel like I'm one of the few people at this point who's talking about human capital bonds and the, and the role that COVID is playing. And if, if the best I can do is to tell other well-meaning white people that these impact investing opportunities, that people who are attending church at the Unitarian churches who would like to have the Black Lives Matter and all the nice banners out there, if they do that, but they don't actually scrutinize that their ESG, like environmental sustainable governance programs are um, harming people, are potentially blockchaining children, then we've got a problem. And so that's what I'm here today to say that the plan, the overall larger plan, is to turn people into these data commodities and it will be done under the cover of progressivism. So um, anyway, I think that's, that's mostly what, what I'm gonna talk about, but educational technology, healthcare, mHealth, 
um, and these impact markets and, and also understanding the role of foster care as a social impact market as well because that's the origins of this charitable institution. So, thanks. So what is, how's, how does foster care play into it? Well, so I think, I think these programs will be framed as trying to reduce foster care and I think that's what's a little bit insidious about it because these, these interventions that are promoted will, um, once the debt tied to the foster care services becomes securitized, and that is the plan, is that they will privatize public services, they will have private investors front the debt, and then that debt will be securitized, just like the toxic mortgages that we talked about in the last financial crisis. Only this portfolio of toxicity will be human capital, will be actual people, will be toddlers, will be um, children in, in difficult, vulnerable situations. And I think many of the foster care situations will likely be, given the economic um, crisis of this lockdown, will be due to poverty. It, they will frame it as neglect, not that these children are in danger because their parents are actively harming them. It's because the economic circumstances have been created that parents are not able to provide for their families in ways that they should be able to provide, especially with the automation of the labor force that's coming with the fourth industrial revolution. So knowing that, that the plan is likely to continue to criminalize poverty and then intervene in those families with solutions, but that the solutions, the debt on that could be securitized once it's securitized, there are hedge funds betting against good outcomes, right? There's some people who might bet for a quote unquote good outcome as defined on a pay for success contract, but there also may be hedge funds betting against having a good outcome. And once you create markets in something like foster care services, if it's, a, if it's profitable, the logic dictates you're not going to get rid of that market. Logic dictates if you have a profitable market in managing foster care, you have a, no incentive to create the ability of families to economically sustain themselves at a, at a good wage with benefits and not need have their children be at risk and taken away from them. And so we are creating, we are embedding in this system really reprehensible and nefarious processes under the guise of helping. And what really needs to happen is that right now all of these resources are locked up. They're locked up in these top 60 billionaires of the world. And no matter everyone behaving exactly the way Jeff Bezos or Warren Buffett or you know Michael Bloomberg says isn't going to make them give their money back to the people. And no no amount of human capital bonds or philanthropic capitalism complements of the likes of the Casey Foundation is going to remedy that. I don't see any of them asking for those resources to be redistributed. Next stop, we're just a couple blocks away. We are at the uh, Basilica of Baltimore, which is the, the first cathedral um, in Baltimore. It was built in the early 19th century. And um, we're here not so much because of the cathedral. It was a, a bit more of a schlep. Baltimore is also home to something called Catholic Relief Services, which is the sort of the global aid division of the Catholic Church, uh, the humanitarian agency of the Catholic community. And I thought it was really important here to talk about um, the, the Vatican uh, impact investing uh, conferences that have taken place. There was one in 2014, 2016, and 2018. And that, that happened in conjunction with the uh, um, Mendoza Business School of Notre Dame. And it brought together many people who were very active in the um, social impact bond and pay for success finance space um, over those three years. Um, one of the major players involved was also uh, folks from uh, uh, Omidyar, um, the Omidyar network. Pierre Omidyar is the founder of eBay. And of course, eBay, again, being auctions, right? And price setting on auctions. So again, we're sort of back to the bond markets and the significance of the auction process in human capital bonds and chattel slavery. Again, echoes of that reverberating up from the beginning. And what I've, I've often said is that what we're seeing manifest now is actually an extension of the doctrine of discovery of the papal bull that said, if you are not Christian, um, you know, the transatlantic slave trade, you can, you can go, you can go to new worlds, you can take resources, you can take people um, in the name of, of, of Christianity. And that a lot of what we're seeing now goes back at least 400 years to that doctrine of discovery. And it's important to understand that connection. Um, also bookkeeping um, with the rise of this, this um, global exploration and trade of resources and theft of bodies from Africa and brought to the new world. And um, that was, 
the accounting ledgers, the double uh, entry bookkeeping that happened, that was all part of that. So now blockchain is the newest extension of the double uh, entry bookkeeping ledger. So I just want to speak a moment about the Catholic Relief Services. Um, they are part of this Better Than Cash Alliance. So that's what Bill Gates is pushing um, for digital currency and the delivery of humanitarian aid in digital formats. But then, of course, that is tied to tokenized behavior. And we know that um, MasterCard and others are working in Africa and they are sort of tokenizing things like prenatal care for pregnant mothers and putting that on blockchain and putting babies on blockchain in order to tokenize um, supposed humanitarian assistance. Um, Accenture has a, has a relationship with them. So they've, they have a close relationship with Catholic Relief Services as well. Um, this Impact Investing Advisory Committee uh, which has like three or four pages of people who are involved in this impact committee, the folks who were at these Vatican Bank uh, impact meetings for these over the course of these six years. Uh, the the co-chair of this, her name is Patricia Deneen, and Patricia Deneen is affiliated with the Boston Archdiocese, okay? So we can go back to what we said earlier about family separation and foster care and understand the reverberations of um, the predation that took place under cover of the Catholic Church in many archdioceses around child sexual abuse and exploitation. And so the fact that the head of the social impact investing is tied to the Archdi Boston Archdiocese, there's some significance in that. She is also the, um, uh, the uh, she's part of the Emerging Markets Private Equity Association. Again, reinforcing the fact that this isn't actually a humanitarian project, but the misery and trauma of um, individuals, whether they be individuals abroad or the, the domestic impoverished people here at home, those numbers are swelling with the lockdown and the uh, implosion of the economy. Um, those are seen as investment opportunities and which if they're profitable, they will simply expand those opportunities. So I'm here to say that when I again speak about faith communities and channeling capital, um, there are a number of faith communities and I'm not saying strictly Christian. There are many faith communities in different parts of the world that are poised to take advantage of the dispossession of the COVID response and to use that misery and channel their capital that are held in their reserves under the guise of being the good guys. So I'm, I'm just here to say um, that I, uh, I don't think that's a good idea. <laughs> we shouldn't be using turning people into human capital commodities. We've done it forever. This is nothing new, but it, it is a legacy that we need to address and have just a little bit more sage left here. But I'm just going to sort of say, you know, within this religious space of a cleansing that we need an accounting of how this happened in the world, how it is continuing to happen what what is really going on that this isn't justice and and to reckon with this history and to be better people and and to do it not out of simply out of guilt but to do it because it's the right thing to do and it's because it involves our healing the healing of catholics and white people and everyone to acknowledge this history and to 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 begin to make it right not that it's a it's a deep deep wound and that those i'm not saying this lightly that's something to be shoved under the rug but it cannot be healed by continuing to turn people into commodities. So um, anyway, I think that's my piece to say. And again, I've said it before, in any given box, there are the people who will work for liberation and the people who will work for domination. And I think that the Vatican Bank turning people into human capital commodities, that is the domination path. But again, we were just in Canesville. Those Catholics, those were revolutionary, liberation-minded Catholics, and they are willing to put themselves on the line for their values to stand against the Vietnam War and militarism. And so those were the kinds of, those are, those are people technically in the same box who are very different people. So we need to address the reality of our situation in this moment and, um, and step up to the challenge. All right. So we were heading for our last stop, which was the Johns Hopkins School of Public Health. Only Google seems to keep messing with our GPS, so we shouldn't probably rely on them to map us around. And we ended up going the wrong way down this back turn, but we turned the corner and we came across this pretty fantastical, can't probably see it in the camera, but it's, we're in a, in a carceral complex area of the city and um, there's an old jail that looks like a 19th century castle kind of jail that the end is torn off. And you can see, like I'm just narrating, but there's all of these jail cells and stairwells and bars over there and they're tearing that down. And 
there, there's a more modern jail here and it's surrounding us these bail bonds. It's, uh, Baltimore Central booking is just in front of us. Right. So it was just a very striking image and we thought um, because Baltimore has been subject to sort of a lot of innovative policing programs through these sort of public-private partnership things, um, I just wanted to take a moment because I know right now we're talking a lot about prison reform and money going into policing and I think it's important that people understand this other, the ways in which the surveillance uh, state control is morphing, right? And if the world becomes a carceral state more broadly through different sorts of e-carceration or digital tracking and monitoring, um, that the, the, the profit stream off of incarceration and forced labor that goes along with that and the services that are forced on people who are incarcerated and their families, um, they have a new model and that new model is going to involve these uh, human capital bonds and, and transitioning returning citizens into society but that will be called everybody's going to get a pathway and an assignment and a tra various kinds of wearable technology tracking to go along with it so they're willing to start to deconstruct aspects of the carceral state because now they have a new business model that that may look different but will also have a new level of brutality so um, Baltimore is targeted as one of a number of cities for heightened policing. It was um, Trump's order called Relentless Pursuit. And also, um, they were a practice area for a somewhat secretive until it was found out, I think, um, surveillance program from the skies that these, the, uh, John Arnold, that is, John Arnold, the, the John and Laura Arnold Foundation are key figures in the impact investing space. They had hired these planes in this technology that was developed, military technology in Iraq to be tried out in Baltimore without the knowledge of the population. So, they want me to say yeah, yes, yeah, so I'm just here with, with the resident and she has some more insights maybe on that. Thanks. Um, yeah, so persistent surveillance system, uh, systems, and it's owned by, by the Arnolds. Um, they, first they did, um, uh, the, the spy plane, um, like Allison said, was operating and no one even knew. Um, now it is in, in its like six month official trial. And in addition to the kind of the more, the ways that we think about surveillance, like, okay, it's, you know, taking our pictures, it's recording like what, what we're doing. Um, it's, it's also going to be used, right, to, to um, help lay the frame, the framework um, to turn Baltimore into a smart city, which basically means um, a surveillance um, city. Right. And then, and I know you can talk more about that. And then um, Operation Relentless Pursuit. Yeah, Baltimore is one of the seven cities um, slated for this surge in, in policing and it's, it's, it's federal funding. And um, so when, you know, when we talk about defunding police and everything, I mean, th this is a separate uh, federal program that wouldn't even be affected by, by, you know, reducing Baltimore Police um, Department's funding. And um, we expect some of that money also, the Operation Relentless Pursuit money, to, to be funneled into these um, surveillance programs. Yeah, so I, I think it's just really important to understand as this backdrop of this prison being disassembled, um, while I mean in some ways it is this idea that's hopeful that we're, we're, we're moving out of a carceral profit center is that now we're moving into other avenues and I think you're right on about the smart city surveillance and the other piece of this is that um, Baltimore is like a data-driven government these open civic tech portals um, and, and working on, you know, even as young as children, um, the Strive Together has a program in Baltimore called ba Baltimore Promise. So sort of grooming children, essentially the cost offset for a lot of these human capital markets is incarceration. And they've been very clear about putting prices on how much it costs to hold people in incarceration, which is very accurate. But what if what you're actually trying to do is, is to create a giant cost offset against which you can start ticking it back by saying, well, we're going to, to impose mental health interventions on you. We're going to impose workforce training interventions. Even though the interventions themselves might make you look like a success on a dashboard, may not meaningfully change the circumstances of your life or solve the structural underpinning, like the impoverishment and lack of economic opportunity that we're, we're gonna see in the fourth industrial revolution. So anyway, we just, we couldn't take, we couldn't drive by and stop and not sort of look at this this carceral state it seemed like it was just like put right in our face that that it is morphing in this moment and we need to we need to be very clear about um 
you know, abolition and, and liberation, but not to fall into a trap um, that's being laid for us by the impact investors. All right, I think this is the last stop of the day. We're here at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Um, if you've heard of Event 201, in relation to the coronavirus tabletop simulation, you might have heard of Johns Hopkins School of Public Health because they were the hosts. And it's important to know that this is named after Michael Bloomberg, the billionaire, the financier. Michael Bloomberg is an alum of Johns Hopkins and his background is in electrical engineering. He was a trustee, he's been a, he was a long-standing trustee of Johns Hopkins and he made a number of major gifts, including one I think that was over a billion dollars, and so they kindly renamed the public school, uh, public health program after him. Now, it's important to know that this uh, public health school was really one of the first ones in the United States, and it was founded with Rockefeller Foundation money. And so for folks who understand the role of Rockefeller in um, sort of creating sort of you know, chemical-based medical interventions as opposed to more homeopathic treatments. It, it was all about the Rockefellers. So it's really important to understand that the Rockefellers were the beginning of Johns Hopkins and the traje trajectory has gone over to Michael Bloomberg. And Michael Bloomberg is about data, data analytics for financial markets, but now increasingly data analytics around health outcomes. And so there is the connection in Event 201 in this tabletop simulation. Um, so I also want to point out that um, Johns Hopkins uh, was working to develop one of the contact tracing online curriculums. So when they hired all these contact tracers to go around, of course, they were trained um, with uh, on an online module because that's what we're doing these days is we're doing online modules for impact investing. And Johns Hopkins developed those modules. I know that the sound is probably, we're sort of, it's awfully busy here for a Sunday afternoon, right? Um, so that's important to know. Um, they're also involved in things like resolve to save lives and lives saved tools. So data-driven tools talking about how medical interventions have impact on lives and chronic illness. Again, those are all impact markets. They're partners with USAID, which is the development aid. So that's the global impact market, so not just, um, you know, people here at home, but also the global aid that's going out. And um, within a global context, it's important to note that one of his student, one of the students who has his PhD in public health here, is Herman Van Oven. Um, he is the scientific director of, for public health of Saisano, and that is based in the EU. And they are doing a lot of the sort of data-driven COVID programming, but it very much tied in with the. Uh, fourth Industrial Revolution, and I, I have a friend in, in Brussels, and so Saisano is a very big piece there, but in this global program, these global actors actually have ties back here to Johns Hopkins. So they're exporting these um, people who will administer the bio-fascist uh, uh, technocracy state regarding um, sort of weaponized bodies. And um, it's important to note too that in 20, um, I think it was in 2017, Johns Hopkins hosted an event with something called the Stewards of Change and the Nation Natural National Interoperability Collaborative, the NIC. And that, that event was held with the School of Public Health. Um, I believe it was called Taking Action During Disruptive Times, Advancing Progress on Innovation. And they, they collaborated with Stewards of Change and NIC and their focus is very much about interoperable data collection again for um, UN SDG 3 health data markets and AI tracking and predictive analytics on healthcare, which means all of the healthcare systems have to start being mediated through digital platforms, not just with your electronic health record, but through telemedicine and teletherapy and nanotechnology and um, medical interventions that can be tracked as data because it's not really about curing you and curing illness, it's about managing chronic illness as an investment market. Um, let's see, one of the divisions is about health security, the Johns Hopkins Center for Health Security, that's a division of the school. Again, health security, it is healthcare reframed as a state security interest issue, which means 
they're setting it up that intervening in your bodily function can be authorized as a national security issue. And that's really important with how that's going to go with the vaccines is they want the authority under national security to impose their will about how your body functions um, within this new environment of you know, nanorobotics. So, so that's an important piece. Um, you know, I, I think that's probably most, most of what I want to say. I just, I do want to say they are connected to impact investing. They developed something called the family-based recovery model, which was um, an addiction treatment program. And again, addiction is another impact market. And they developed this um, intervention program that was piloted in, on families in Connecticut, which a lot of hedge funds operate out of Connecticut. So it was poor women who had child justice involvement and um, a substance use designation. And so they were given this intervention that was developed here at Johns Hopkins Public Health. Um, and, and it was tracked as a, a pay for success program. And the investors in these poor women in Connecticut, the investors in this program were things like BNP Paribas, which is a French bank and QBE Insurance, which is an Australian insurance company. So these women and their families were becoming commodity, investable commodities in these markets um, strictly because largely, I believe, their economic circumstances, the, the study indicated these women were making less than $10,000 a year trying to raise a family in Connecticut, you can imagine. And so rather than addressing their issues, they just put them on an intervention program developed here at Johns Hopkins, again, in service of these global investors. Um, so I think that will sort of close out our day, but I really recommend look into um, Stewards of Change, look into Nas Nas National Interoperability Collaborative, the data that's being aggregated is not just healthcare data. It's actually also feeding into the fusion centers and into um, the national centers for crime and delinquency. So it isn't simply about healthcare. It's about criminalizing individuals and, and, and expanding the nature of state um, control over individuals' lives and bodies. So um, anyway, just it's not just about Gates. It's also about Bloomberg. And I just want to reemphasize that and that the historic trajectory that it's about Rockefeller and Bloomberg and COVID and contact tracing and security state is all in one tidy package here. Um, and it, this isn't some abstract thing. It, I'm coming here to show you this is where it happens. It happens in an everyday office building where people go in and out to work and do their jobs and don't really think about the bigger picture. And what I'm asking people is to stop right now and think about the bigger picture. So thanks, everybody.